Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. You can send us a tweet at the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed. That is at Bomani underscore Jones. All right, congratulations to the Golden State Warriors. Got their championship on. Yeah, good for them. Kevin Durant went out there and finally got his ring. By the way, here is Kevin Durant. He says that support from the teammates is what made all the difference. I remember the first day of camp, you know what I'm saying, and I walking into camp and I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what these guys was like, were like on the court, and you know how they how they came in and worked. I didn't, I didn't know anything about the team, you know, and I, and I just wanted to come in there and just be me. And I did that from day one, and I just tried to stay with that. I had my I had my you know lulls in the season where I was beating myself up, where I was struggling throughout the year and to have teammates that encourage you that lift you up that's what we all need in life you know what I mean and and it was it was amazing to just see that all year and right now just to to be here with these guys man it's amazing so I wanted to play that sound because I saw a lot of people who were making the argument and Draymond Green has said this too, like the idea that Kevin Durant was the consolation prize for them not winning the championship last year, right? We did win the championship, but we got Kevin Durant. I've also seen other people make the argument, my man Dan Lebatard makes this point, I saw the homie Dave Zirin say this, that the greatest testament to um, the greatness of LeBron James is that after losing those finals, that they looked at themselves and said, okay, well, I guess we got to go get Kevin Durant now, right? And so I think there's this, like, really big belief that the only reason Kevin Durant showed up there was because they didn't win the championship last year. And I'm like, dog, don't y'all realize Kevin Durant was coming there regardless? Like, everybody can make this talk now where Durant, you know, well, if they won the championship, it would look too bad for Kevin Durant to come and da 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 and everything else. Shannon, what was that, last February that we got that first report from Adrian Wojnarowski that Kevin Durant was looking at going to the Warriors? Right. We had people talking about it in 2015. In fact, our next guest is Michael Thompson. If I'm not mistaken, Michael Thompson said way back, watch, Kevin Durant is going to come to the Warriors. You know why Kevin Durant came to the Warriors? Kevin Durant came to the Warriors because they looked like they were having fun over there. Right? Like, he looked at the way they got down, the way they played, and he looked at the way his own squad played and was like, nah, man, I'm good. Everybody and their mama blames Russell Westbrook on that. But the reality is, Russell Westbrook is stuck in that same boring offense the way that Kevin Durant was. Yeah, man, it's May 2015 that Michael Thompson said Kevin Durant was going to come to the Warriors. But you think Russ wants to be in an offense where everybody knows what's going on? Like, this is the player that Russ has evolved into in large part. I think it's a nature-nurture sort of situation. But a lot of it is the nurture that's, take, that's taking place there. Man, Kevin Durant was going over there regardless. And so I had people who hit me up and they're like, well, yeah, man, you know, well, the Warriors wouldn't have needed Kevin Durant because they won a championship. Look, man, Harrison Barnes was a free agent. That means they didn't have a small forward because Harrison Barnes was a free agent. So what are you going to do? Pay Harrison Barnes. What's Harrison? I think Harrison Barnes is making something like $22 million this year. I think Kevin Durant made something in the neighborhood of like 25 or 26 So what are you going to do if you got the option? Pay Harrison Barnes 22 or pay Kevin Durant 26 Because I feel like if you're the type to pay Harrison Barnes the 22 instead of paying Kevin Durant the 26 you know who you are? You're the guy who rents the Nissan Versa. I got a little theory about life. We all make these weird decisions where we decide we're going to save money. And one place where we love to say that we're going to save money is with the rental car, right? Like, that's what we do, the rental car. I remember when I was first moving to Miami, I used to fly back to Durham um, to go get stuff, you know, pack it up, get move out of my house or whatever. And the first time I went up there, I had to rent a car. And so I got the cheapest rental car they had because I'm only going to be there for a couple of days. And I got that Nissan Versa. Shannon, I tried to push that Nissan Versa up a hill, bro. It was like, Hoo! Man, it's like somebody tried to do that, try to do that tenth rep on two twenty five. It was just, oh, oh. and I'm like, I did all this to save fifteen dollars, like to save fifteen dollars. I'm up here with my foot on the ground, going forty miles an hour up what ain't even really a hill, just an, just an incline. I remember when you made that trip back. You was like, yeah, man, I got this Nissan Versa. <laughs> yeah, never again. Never again. Never again. I was like, I'm never getting. This is not the place for me to save fifteen dollars, right? 
that's where I feel like you would have been. If you would have signed Harrison Barnes just because y'all won a championship instead of paying the $4 million more or whatever it is to get Kevin Durant, you the one that's out here pushing this Nissan Versa. Mad as hell about it the whole weekend, man. Psh, I could have got me a maximum. Right? Like, that's that's what that is. No, man, you go ahead and pay that $15 extra, and you go ahead and you get you the Nissan Versa. That's what it is. There's no way in the world that they were going to be out there like, okay, we could bring back Harrison Barnes, or for a mere $4 million more, we could sign Kevin Durant. They're going to be like, nah, nah, nah. We don't want Kevin Durant. We would be too good. Like, by the same token, when Kevin Durant's out here looking for a job, and, you know, I know your argument is not that the Warriors were good, it's that the Warriors had beat the Thunder last year. Yeah, 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 I hear you. But this is the only time I've ever seen a situation where a player went and found the best team and the team went and found the best player, and somehow y'all trying to explain to me why that is a problem. He was going to be there either way, and he was going to be there either way because, number one, the Warriors aren't dumb, and number two, Neither is Kevin Durant. Now, I thought that Kevin Durant was going to sign for one more year with Oklahoma City, get to year 10, and then he'd opt out, and then he'd be able to get, like, the bigger contract. That's what I thought that he was ultimately going to do. Didn't work that way. He's like, nah, I'm trying to get on this program right now, immediately. Well, Kevin, they don't have your bird rights. We'll get to it. I want to get there right now. And he went there right then. Got his got his ring. Got his bread. What's there to knock? But I, I want to talk to you guys, though, just about this logic that you that people are play, putting out here, which is basically that if you win a championship, then somehow you're, like, obligated to bring everybody back. So, like, who are you – at what position are you allowed to improve after you win a championship so that nobody gets their feelings hurt or nobody say that y'all weak or whack or whatever it is, right? So if they decide to upgrade up off of, say, Harrison Barnes and – like, what small forward would have made y'all feel okay with that, right? What well, what would have been all right for you as a replacement? Nah, man, everybody's out here trying to do the best that they can do. And everybody did, and a championship was the end result. And I think that's what makes good uh, front office decisions, decision makers, excuse me, where they can separate the emotion from it. Yeah. I know the big thing with the Cavs last year is we want everybody back. LeBron, I want my brother Tristan to come back. I want these guys. Where you look at the Warriors, they evaluate the situation like, yeah, Harrison, you were great. We drafted you. But, yeah, we have a chance to bring Kevin Durant in. So that's what we're going to do. But also, to be fair, if Kevin Durant had been available, LeBron James would not have been talking about bringing back no Tristan Thompson, right? Like, like, they're, like they're, I, I do agree with you that people do get emotional and they make these decisions. Like, I think the Cavs probably needed to make some hard decisions about Kyrie and Kevin Love. Well, it wasn't going to be about Kyrie after he hit that three. But I think they needed to make some hard decisions about Kevin Love, and they did not because they won the championship. Like, totally get how people wind up making – those sorts of mistakes. The thing I think that gets lost in this about the Warriors, though, was the Warriors needed another player who could get his own shot. Like at the end of last year, and I think we saw this also in the 2015 playoffs, they just happened to get through it. They only had one guy who could get his own shot, and that was Steph. So if Steph was hurt or Steph wasn't playing well, there wasn't another guy on the roster who could get his own shot. So if you're the Warriors, you're coming out here like, okay, well, we need to find one more guy who can get his own shot. Well, who's available that can get his own shot? Kevin Durant? No, no, no. We don't want him. All I need is somebody who can get his own shot. But you got the money for it. All we need is somebody that can get his own shot. No, man. You get the best guy available for getting his own shot. And again, I don't think that was a luxury for the Warriors. I think it happened that they had a need that they were able to fill and then have some luxury left over. I can't knock anybody for that. All right, now, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number right fast. I do want want you to hear this sound from LeBron Jay. Somebody asked LeBron if he was happy Kevin Durant won a title. Well, I'm not happy he won his first. I'm not happy at all. But at the end of the day, from where when I played him in the 2012 finals to now, like I said, experience is the best teacher in life, and he's just experience and experience and experience. And, you know, he felt like he needed to – reassemble and reassess his career and and come here having you know getting that first championship was for me was like having my, my first son you know just a proud moment it was something that uh you, you for, never ever forget and at the end of the day nobody can um anybody say from now on in your career or whatever they say they can never take away from you being a champion i just want to know who asked him are you happy for kevin durant like maybe tomorrow not today 
All right, now, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number coming up next. This warriors Cavs rivalry got the chance to be as good as Celtics-Lakers. We'll talk to Michael Thompson, father of Clay and former Laker on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. That's the old soul song of the day. Life is too short by too short. I mean, I figure Oakland wins a championship. We got to put on a little bit for Oakland. And when the Warriors win a championship, we go a step further. Joining us now on the line, you can check him out on ESPN Radio in Los Angeles. They also tell me that his son plays for the Golden State Warriors. His name is Michael Thompson. So, Michael, what's it like for you? Second time watching your son win a championship. I guess y'all are even all rings now, huh? Well, before before we get to that, I was thinking about that uh, little uh, bit you had coming in about listening to a song that gets you going, an old soul song. And I was I've been listening, I've been obsessed with listening to two songs lately that you probably never heard of, Bomani. I'll test your uh, rock and roll or your your musical history knowledge. I've been I've been really jamming a lot to "Concrete Jungle" by Bob Marley. You ever heard of that? You don't know who you're talking to right now, man. Of course I know "Concrete Jungle." No chains around my feet, right. but I'm not free. Wow, man, I'm impressed with you even more than ever now. And then the other song, I know you don't know this one, Simple Man by Leonard Skinner. I am actually, Shannon, what does my T-shirt say right now? Leonard Skinner. I am wearing a Leonard Skinner T-shirt right now. What? Yeah, man. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, (laughs) man. No wonder... Yeah, wow, that is great. Well, I love those two songs. I've just been jamming to them a lot. Maybe, and that's, what, that's those two songs have been calming me down over the last two weeks because I've been really tense with the Warriors. And like you said, <laughs> what was it like to watch Clay win the second one last night? I tell you, you wouldn't want to be around me for about two and a half hours of that game because I was frozen in place and fear of LeBron James and, and Kyrie Irving and those Cavs because they they got it down to like five points, a couple of possessions away in the fourth quarter. And, man, I couldn't move. I was so scared because I thought they had a chance to send it back to Cleveland for game six. And if they get back to Cleveland for game six, you know what's going to happen there. There's going to be a game seven. So, But watching that last night when they finally uh, had it sewn up in the last two minutes, uh, I'll tell you, Bomani, it's um, – well, let me put it in terms that I think everybody listening to us can understand who is a parent. No matter what your child is doing, if they're doing something they love, they have a passion for, and, of course, it's illegal – uh, if they're doing something that uh, you see them having a passion for and they're being successful at it, then you know how I feel. I, I feel no different from any parent out there. It's just that my son is doing a very public job on a big public stage. And so you would, but I feel no different from any parent out there seeing their child succeed and they're passionate and whatever they have a passion for. Now, how does it work for you, though, when he struggles? Because he did seem to have a difficult time this postseason. Yeah, he was struggling for a while with a shot, but I love the way he was c- continued to compete. He continued to look for a shot. He didn't let it affect the rest of his game, going out there and trying to play his be- the best defense he could. And he better be on the all-defensive team after he- what he showed in the last <laughs> couple of months on defense. I don't know who else they're going to put over him at the guard position. I think him and Avery Bradley are the two best uh, defensive guards in the league. So hopefully the-, the-, the voters will do Clay some justice and put him on the all-defensive team. All right, we are talking to Michael Thompson. I have to ask you this because I always love talking to guys about this whose parents played in the league or whose children played in the league. What were the driveway games like? I could beat Clay up until he was about 14, and he started to get a little rangy, got a little stronger, and I was in my late 40s, early 50s by then. So by that time, I couldn't the, the old man game, back and down game, couldn't work anymore because as soon as I missed, I never got the ball back again. Here's the question, though. After he beat you once, was that the end? Was that the end of the, oh, yeah. the Thompson robbery? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, did. I knew my place then. I knew it was <laughs> over. So I figured, okay, I passed the torch on to him and his older brother, Michael, and I, I, I understand my place. My time has now come and gone, and now it's his time. All right, we are talking to Michael Thompson of ESPN Los Angeles on the right time. Now, I'm curious, like, when you thought about, like, what did you think the ceiling was for his game? Because he was a bit of a late riser in high school. He wound up being a top 50 player. He was, I think, the number 10 pick in the draft, which is not where you get a star player normally. Like, did you think that his end result in the NBA could be what it's become? Well, I got to be careful because I don't want to come off sounding like LeVar Ball, who I love, (laughs) by the way, but we all know how LeVar is. But I told Clay in high school – uh, when I saw his all-around ability to play the game, Bomani, I told him, I said, Clay, if you follow the three H's, like the triple H, just like in wrestling, if you stay humble, you stay hungry, and you stay healthy, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. Of course, he looked at me with disbelief, like, I, I'm not thinking that way of myself. But I told him, I said, you are a Hall of Fame player, 
if you follow those three rules. Because I saw the talent. How did the University of Minnesota not make an offer with him? Because I think it's interesting with he and Steph, where both of you guys, you know, both of your parents played and did not get offers from your father's alma maters, even though you might have been the greatest players in the history of those schools. Well, Monty, I can identify with Del Curry. Del Curry was calling his alma mater. I think it was uh, Virginia Tech, begging them to take his son, Steph. Uh, the coach at the time, uh, we don't want to say who it was, cause, but we know who it was, didn't think Steph was a uh, Division One player. Uh, I, I was in the same position. I called Minnesota. I called SC, UCLA. I called, I called uh, University of Washington, all those Pac-12 schools. I said, listen, man, take my son. He's going to be a three- or four-year player. He's not a one-and-done guy, but he's going to be there for three or four years. He can play. All those coaches didn't think he was a D1 player. So what can you do? We are talking to Michael Thompson of ESPN Los Angeles. I want to switch gears just a little bit because that 30 for 30 is coming on tonight about the Lakers and Celtics, and that's a rivalry that you were a part of. For you, joining those 1987 Lakers, what was that like showing up on that team? Oh, man, Bamani, I was in the league for eight years before that. And then when I walked in that Laker locker room and I talked to Jerry West in his office and talked to Pat Riley when they uh, traded for me, and it, it goes to another level is when you join a team like that, you're already in the NBA. They are supposed to be your peers, but they're really not because they're at a different level. So when I left the San Antonio Spurs and, and walked in that Laker locker room, the expectations to win, uh, the all or nothing, it's championship or bust. It's a completely different uh, atmosphere, completely different attitude and approach to the game, as it is now if you join the Cleveland Cavaliers or the, 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 the Golden State Warriors. You walk into that locker room as a, play, a new player coming in, you are expected to produce, expected to follow the lines, and expected to win. Now, how quickly did you get on to the expectation of hating the Boston Celtics? Oh, I always hated them because I grew up a <laughs> Laker fan watching Jerry West and Will Chamberlain. So, of course, the Celtics were their big rivalry. So even when I was in the Bahamas as a kid, I was always a Laker, Laker lad. I loved the Lakers ever since then. And even when I played against them, I had so much admiration and respect for Magic and Jamal Wilkes and Norm Nixon and Kareem and the whole gang you, you guys all know about. So... Yeah, so I, I always was a more of a Laker fan than a Celtic fan. And before I even joined the Lakers, when they met in the finals, oh man, I, was, I was pulling for the Lakers as if I was in that locker room. Right, we were talking to Michael Thompson of ESPN Los Angeles. So you know I got to ask you, those 88 Lakers against these Warriors, who you got? I got oh, I got to be careful because, you know, Magic's the mayor of Los Angeles. <laughs> he could have me exiled. So I got to be careful how I answer this. Now listen, I believe we could beat them. I really do. Obviously Magic said he believes we would sweep them. Uh, but uh, the great champions like Magic, they all think that way. That they're not going to concede to anybody. But, you know, I guess if you just do the simple math for money, threes beat two. We shot eight threes a game. These guys shoot eight threes a quarter and make most of them. So I, 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 I'm going to go with the Warriors. And I know that I'm going to Magic's going to be mad at me, but I'm going with the Warriors. Now, here's a question that I think would be a little easier for you, though. You won't have any conflict about this. Could you see Cavs-Warriors becoming a rivalry like Celtics-Lakers, given that we've had them in the finals three years in a row? Oh, it, it already is, because now we're going to have it for three more years, but money. Where are these teams going? None of these teams are going nowhere. There's nobody in the East that he could come even close to challenging LeBron. LeBron's 32. Does he look like he's slowing down to you? Kyrie's coming into his own now as a superstar himself, and you know they're always going to put the right pieces around LeBron to keep them in the, uh, the Eastern Conference uh, number one seed. So they're not going to this. So get ready, Bamari, to see this. I'm going to predict it right now for three more years. Warriors-Cavs. So it already is Celtics-Lakers right now. All right. That is Michael Thompson. Check him out on ESPN Radio in Los Angeles. we got to toss some music again, man. I know when I did the show down there, we were supposed to, but we, got, we ran out of time. Yeah, man. We can always talk music. i, I got to throw some Jimi Hendrix Purple Rain in there. Not Purple Rain. Uh, what's that? Um, Purple Haze. Oh, what's his name? Purple Haze. Oh, I love that opening riff. We'll do that, man. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. All right, Bonania. See you on uh, Highly Questionable. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. There are robberies, and then there's Celtics versus the Lakers. Celtics, Lakers, best of enemies, a five-hour, 30 for 30 film event chronicles the story, franchises, epic clashes, and relives the Boston-LA battle from both sides with sensational footage and fresh, insightful interviews. The three-part documentary will pre premiere with parts one and two back-to-back -to -back tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern on ESPN, and tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern, you can watch part three on ESPN. Again, Celtics, Lakers, best of enemies, a new 30 for 30 film premieres tonight. Now, insurance-minded speeches from GEICO. Hardship. My grandmother would go through it every month to pay her insurance bill. First, she would handwrite a paper check, in cursive. Then, using her own tongue, she would wet a stamp for an envelope. 
Today, however, we need not weary our hands and tongues. Today, we can pay our Geico bill with the Geico app. Away with hardship, in with bill pay on the Geico app. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Thanks to Michael Thompson for joining us last segment. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Customers who switch to Progressive save an average of $500. Call or click today and find out if we can save you hundreds on your car insurance. 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. That was fun with Michael Thompson, even though he ain't know who he was talking to about that music. Uh, he had to get the number two pencil. He did. He did. I had to hit him with the lyrics. I had, and I had to send him a picture of me in this Skinner t-shirt, which, of course, you know, people hit me with a, some guy thought he was going to educate me. You might want to read up on Leonard Skinner and the Confederate flag. Wow. Really? Leonard Skinner had the Confederate flag at the concert? I, I had no idea. Wow. It's a complex thing there. But hey, man, one thing I figured out about music, we all got awful people that we listen to. Like, if all of us decided we're not going to listen to any music by people who do things we find to be objectionable, we'd listen to nothing. We cut everybody some slack here and there, right? I cut, like, I thought about this once, all the awful stories I heard about James Brown, and I had to be honest with myself. You're going to have to do a little bit more than that before I stop rocking with James Brown. It happens. 888-729-3776, that is our telephone number. Let's hit the phones and talk to Joe in Raleigh. Joe, I thought you said that the Cavs are going to sweep this, man. Well, my friend, how are you today? I am good, sir. I am not good, my friend. I'm not good at all. We go back to 1980s when Ric Flair was getting jumped by the Russians and Dusty Rose came in to help. And what did Dusty Rose get for his helpness? What did he get for his gratitude like LeBron James coming back to Cleveland, helping the league, help save the league? When uh, Michael Jordan retired, what does LeBron get? He gets jumped. He gets jumped by the four horsemen. He gets jumped by Klay Thompson. Uh, he gets jumped by Curry, and he gets jumped by Kevin freaking Durant. What, what more could he have done, Bomani? What more could LeBron have done? Did he have to sell popcorn? I mean, 30, uh, mid, mid to upper 30s, averaging a triple-double during the finals. What more can the man do? He's got to get some help. What is our society? Do you realize who our champions are in sports right now, Bomani? The Clemson Tigers, the New England Patriots, the North Carolina Tar Heels, and the Golden State Warriors. What a sorry, sorry world we live in right now, Bomani. I don't care what's going you know, I care, but what, what, what's going on overseas, what's going on with political, that doesn't matter right now. Look who we got as our champions. And LeBron James did everything he could do, sweat, blood, tears, sell popcorn, and where was his friends when he needed them? If I'm LeBron, I, I don't care if he comes to Fayetteville, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, to the Lakers, whatever that man's got to do. That man did everything in the world, and he gets jumped in a parking lot and, and can't do anything about it. This isn't on LeBron James. This is on society that we've allowed this to continue. The, the, the suckation of our spirit, of who we are as a unit, this is absolutely the worst I've ever felt in my life when I woke up this morning, Bomani Jones. This isn't funny. This isn't humorous. This just doesn't bring joy to my life. This brings despair. This brings hatred. This brings a part of me that I don't even want to be a part of. I, I, I don't even want to watch sports right now. I have your, your uh, highly questionable on DVR. I don't even want to press play, Bomani. I don't even want to press play. And it's the best day of my life. Take from 4.30 to 5.02, just to make sure you get all the content. It's the worst day of my life, Bomani. What, what, what are we doing right now when Coach K and LeBron and the Pittsburgh Steelers and teams like that are sitting on the sideline watching cheaters, cowards, and bandwagoners win titles? I mean, daggone, Bomani. Next thing you're going to tell me, we're not good at soccer as Americans. I just, I just don't know what to do, Bomani. I don't know where to turn. I don't know who to grasp onto. I can't stand looking at my child right now as he wears them ugly Steve Kerr shoes, <laughs> Curry shoes. It's, it's a, it's a despicable day for America. Joe, is this that is, the same kid you said you're gonna kick out the house over the North yes, Carolina he's gone, championship? Bomani. I don't even know where he is. He graduated on Friday. His bags <laughs> were packed. He's gone. I don't even know his reaction. 
to, to this situation. Not even 100% sure where he lives, Bomani. And not 100% sure I even care where he lives or he gets his next meal. There's a lot of Tar Heel fans out there that can support him. And now there's Golden State fans that can support him. This is a disgusting day for America with, with everything that Coach K and LeBron and Nick Saban have done for America. Who's representing us? Who is our champions? How do you look at your child and tell them everything's going to be all right? Everything's not going to be all right, Bomani. It's not. It's a sad, sad day. And we need NFL football. Maybe it can save us. But I'm not sure even that can do it, Bomani. I'm not even sure that can do it. Joe, I'm wishing you the best, man. You know I'm always wishing you the best. Thank you. I know you and Shannon are there for me, but I don't even think that's enough right now, Bomani. I don't even think that's enough. And I never thought I'd say that out loud in my life. Joe, you have a sign that this Dow says North Carolina won the championship in 2009. One thing I love about you is your memory, but it's not helping me right now, Bomani. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Why don't we put a link like we did last time when you embarrassed me on uh, national TV? You know? I, I didn't embarrass you. Enough you is enough, Bomani. I'm you out, si- man. You I'm signed out. up for the bet, Joe. You did that to yourself. I understand that, but you didn't have to take so much joy from it. I was trying but to promote our radio en- show. Enough is enough, man. Enough is enough. G- 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 hold me and wave your hands over your arms. I'm done, man. I can't answer the bell. I can't answer the bell. You'll be back next season. That's you'll a be, sad day. A you'll sad be back day, next season, Joe. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be back. <laughs> that Coach K tattoo ain't going nowhere. But still, <laughs> it's, a, it's a sad, sad day. Not only for me, but for America. And uh, I've had enough, Omani. I've had enough. You're my man, Joe. I appreciate the call. I do, but end the call now before I cry. <laughs> okay, okay. Eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. That is our telephone number. Shady wasn't ready for that, was he? I wasn't ready for that. I figured when I when they told me Joe was on the line, I thought about it. I was like, Wait a minute, LeBron and the Cavs lost the championship. Yeah, I don't even know what specifically Joe wanted to talk about, but we're going right to Joe. Yes, and poor Joe. He had to get it out, though, because Joe's not a big tweeter. He's on Twitter, Joe and Raleigh, but he's not a big tweeter. Usually I say, you know, tweet it out. Get it out the system. Joe had to do that professional wrestling shoot interview just now. Yes, he did. And, by the way, my radio show is much better for it. Much better for it. By the way, we got a dispatch here from the Kobe stands. They have to be very happy after seeing LeBron lose that one. Like, I guess, you know, they're the same state, but the Lakers of Warriors don't have any sort of rivalry. I wish they did have a rivalry, though, so we could see what the Kobe stands would do, like how torn they would be on what side they should pick, you know, because, you know, I feel like, though, the Kobe stands root against LeBron harder than they ever rooted for Kobe. I think they don't really di- they don't really dislike the Warriors. Like you said, there's no real rivalry that b- between the Lakers and the Warriors, so they can care less. It's all about LeBron and LeBron not... And, and LeBron and his conversations with LeBron and uh, Jordan yes. and the disrespect that they feel as though Kobe's received in this whole LeBron-Jordan uh, conversation. Well, tell me this. Do the Kobe stands root harder against LeBron than you used to root against Kobe? No way. <laughs> Not even close. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Coming up next, we'll catch you up on what you haven't heard today about that Game 5. You're listening to ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80. All right, Kevin Durant got all the juice now. Went out last night and clinched his first championship. He was named Finals MVP. And if you haven't heard, here's Bomani Jones early today on the right time discussing whether or not the NBA is now Durant's league. I can't imagine someone as good as Kevin Durant from a previous era really wanting to be like, yeah, I mean, I could carry a team, but who wants to do that? And I got no problem with him for the fact that he made that decision. Like, I'm not casting any, like, hey, there's no judgment that I'm raining upon him because that's how he feels, right? Like, I'm not. But that is how he feels, you know? So when we say, hey, man, the league's not going to be Kevin Durant's, I don't think Kevin Durant cares because Kevin Durant doesn't even care if the Warriors are his. Now, take LeBron James, who by definition would count as being a millennial. LeBron James knows the league is his, seems to kind of like the fact that the league is his, and damn sure every team that he's been on has been his, right? Durant's wired a little bit different. That, that's just not where he is. He does not care whether or not the league is his. And I got a lot of respect for him being like, look, I'm just trying to be the best I can. I'm trying to control the part that I can control. Because he sounds like he's a lot happier than that sociopath Michael Jordan, who's always out here for somebody to beat. Michael Jordan doesn't like winning. Michael Jordan likes beating people. Two different things.
All right, uh, we all, we're all in agreement that it's still LeBron's league, though, and we, obviously we don't know how much longer LeBron is going to play, but who do you see being the next guy, the guy to take over? Is, is that guy in the league now? I mean, could it be Anthony Davis, for example? Um, like, I just don't think there'll ever be like, – there won't be another LeBron. It's just like even Shaq, as big a thing as Shaq was, it wasn't Shaq's league. Which is wild to consider because he kind of jumped into it, but I think Jordan kind of messed that up for him. Like it might have stayed Shaq's league if it were not for the Jordan return. But I don't know if the league is built like that now at this point for there to be this one guy where it's like, okay, it's you. LeBron's the last guy to really come into the league with that kind of fanfare, is he? The league is the league fine with that. Does the league need to have that one player that we all say it's his, like we did with Jordan, like we did with LeBron? I think it helps, but you know what, though? Teams that people rally around help also, because go look at those TV ratings, man. The Warriors do it. They do it. You got a guy like Russell Westbrook. He does it, even though the team isn't good necessarily. So I think the league is at a point now, though, where they can sell their whole menu of stars rather than having that one guy. But it is better to have that one guy. My man Ninth Wonder makes that point. He's like, he thinks the NBA pushes LeBron because they found that it's better for business to have one guy like they had with Michael Jordan. And he's probably right. But I just don't see the next one. You got these super teams. You got LeBron and all that good stuff. But we all know that in order for the league to really thrive, there's only one organization that has to start contributing to this, and it's my New York Knicks. Moving on. And you're right, by the way. Like, <laughs> like the, if the Knicks get good, like really good, I can't think of what will be better for the NBA other than getting another LeBron. Wow. Can, 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 we, can we mark that right there, guys? I want to make sure that we got that. Uh, don't we, get me we, wrong. We're running on that. It's, Just pretty wanna... good. it's pretty good for the league when the Knicks are bad, too. <clears throat> Moving on. All righty, so obviously Kevin Durant. MVP of the finals. So we had a Twitter poll on the ESPN radio Twitter account asking who would you have voted for second in the NBA finals MVP voting? And the options were LeBron James, Steph Curry, or thirdly, someone else. And 68% of the voters said they would vote LeBron James. Interestingly, by the way, shout out to all you guys who are real big into the integrity of Twitter polls. So many people, oh, that's just stupid. Why do we even need to do this? It's a Twitter poll, man. And I appreciate oh, the over 3,000 folks who voted on it as Thank well. Thank you. Uh, uh, Steph Curry in this poll, 25%. The folks thought that Steph would be second in uh, MVP voting. Well, all right. Third third finals, no no MVPs for, for Steph, but I'm sure he'll he's fine with that, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, you it's, know. It's a team, right? All right, moving on. Our second Twitter uh, poll today on the ESPN Radio Twitter account asked, is Kyrie Irving a top five point guard in the NBA? Yes, he is, or no, he's not. 70% of the voters says, yes, he is a top five point guard in the league. Interesting. I'm shocked by that. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many people really tried to count it out because it sounds crazy when you watch him play to say to somebody else that he would not be in the top five. Somebody tried to tell me that Kyrie was one of the top five players in the NBA. I'm like, he wasn't one of the top five players in this series. My, my only problem with Kyrie, he's a dynamic talent, and no one can stay in front of him, but how much better does he make his teammates? I'd say name one other thing. that, like After you say that, that nobody can guard Kyrie. Nobody can stay in front of him. Now say something else. But a team can a team eventually win with Kyrie being the main guy? Like I know, obviously you have LeBron here, but there's a hey, 2018s right around the corner. Can the, a team win with Kyrie being the main guy? Unless not unless something like drastic changes about his game. Like I'd rather have Russell Westbrook in that position than have Kyrie Irving. Mm-hmm. And we got the questions about him. I think these are similar questions that we had when you bring up with Carmelo Anthony. Phenomenal right. talent, but he can't be the one. Right. All right. Last and certainly not least, a tattoo artist in Brazil was arrested for torture after he inked I'm a thief on the forehead of a 17-year-old who he allegedly stole a bike. He alleges that the 17-year-old stole a bike. So what did he do? He tattooed I'm a thief on the 17-year-old's forehead. Yeah, yeah, don't get me wrong. He wrong for that, but I got a lot of questions with this 17-year-old. Like, No, apparently he was someone else held him down. Really? Yeah, someone else held the 17-year-old down. Then the tattoo artist tattooed I'm a thief on his forehead. It's not enough to get the bike back? Exactly. He tattooed it on his forehead. Like yeah. if this is about the bike, y'all got the bike. Like 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 how about why has it gotta be on my forehead of all how I'm supposed to get a job now? Right. But ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on the right time. We do this every weekday, four PM Eastern. Shannon, Steven, Mike A. Thanks so much for joining. Oh yeah, yeah, whatever. Jalen Jacoby coming up next.